This is a free podcast from the BBC. For more information, you can go to our website, bbc.co.uk slash radio2. When I woke up on Friday, I says Barnsley chop, I could smell lavender and the very deep foreboding sense that there were Irish nearby. Sure enough, there you were on Tit Wireless, speaking to us with your voice from Leeds. Uh, I hear that Barrowlands got clapped into a room. Well, in Yorkshire, it's tradition to clap a Scotsman who can enter any room under the power of his own legs. I didn't say he was under the power of his own legs. He was helped into the room by a young lady. <laughs> and indeed, we both had to be helped out. So I told my wife, says Len Horrible, on Friday that you were in Leeds, which on Friday you were. You noticed them then. Uh, she said, looking down her nose in a way that women have, really? Well, he didn't come to say hello to us, did he? and gave me what I can only describe as a look. Well, maybe we won't go to see him when we're in London. Next, if that's his way, she barked as she flounced out of the room, throwing her Sudoku on the floor. Oh, any woman who throws a Sudoku on the floor is not to be trusted. David Basford and Market Drayton, I heard your old mate and mucker, the chicken feeder, Peter Alice, say, while commentating on the British Masters, that he'd been watching Carol Vorderman and he got aroused. Yes, he did say he was a seven-letter word. And congratulations to him. Perhaps when you next see him, you could remind him that, as my old dad used to say, there comes a time in a man's life. It's better to travel, hopefully, than it is to arrive. There's no need to tell Peter Alice that. He knows it. And he's also a bit of an expert on countdown. You mentioned the other day that you, as you get a little more mature, good lighting takes on greater importance, yes? In the dark with the light behind us is the best way to get us. Well, I've discovered the right angle is pretty essential, too. There I was, says Alice Clark. Oh, good morning, Alice. There I was, leaning over our new smoked glass coffee table yesterday, giving it a good polish, when I happened to notice that staring back up at me was a strangled chicken with a surprised expression. Oh, scary. Scary. Hmm? Did you watch Strictly over the weekend? You don't call it Strictly, come down. It's Strictly now. Some surprising results. <laughs> and, uh, John Sargent, excuse me, how long is he going to persist in it? The man cannot put a foot under him, but I guarantee you he'll end up in the final. Uh, good morning, good looking. After having spent years paying off my mortgage, I'm now told by the government I owe over 50 billion on other mortgages that I don't remember asking for. Ah, you see, El Ali Pop, you didn't consolidate your loans. Uh, good to see our revered Chancellor is helping to save B&Bs in the UK, says Perseverance. My little bed and breakfast business on Hailing Island has taken somewhat of a downturn this season, mainly due to the poor quality food, fleas in the bedding, the bar being closed, no toilet seats, and several bedroom doors missing. I accept I've run the business badly. I can't see any flaw so far, Percy. There must be free use of cruet, I imagine, and and carpets in all main rooms, but I wonder if several billion pounds could be shoved my way in order to prop this ailing business up by darling, darling, darling. If he can do it for one B&B, &B, he should do it for all bed and breakfast places. I think you've probably misunderstood, Percy, but I can't put my finger on where. Could you tell him that Mrs. Verence will make it worth his while with two nice, full-to-the-brim baps? <laughs> If <laughs> I can go no further. We've already gone too far. And uh, so did Saunders. He left the country in a marked manner and he came back and he regretted it. Saunders a bungie. Returned to the UK on Friday, some hour and forty minutes before me bags. <laughs> oh, look, you think the, the airport you came in is bad. Have you tried Terminal 1 at Heathrow lately? <laughs> or Dublin Airport? Whoa! <laughs> Anyway, my wife says my depression is caused by being without bifidus digestivum and pentapeptides while I was away. These essential chemicals are unknown in the Greek islands. What they do have, though, is five-litre boxes of wine for eight euros. This reduces the appearance of wrinkles by destroying your eyesight. Well, there's a strange light in the sky over London this morning. It could be could not the sun again. Yesterday, according to Scotland's biggest-selling newspaper, the Sunday Mail... It must be true. The 15th World Stone Skimming Championships were held. Easdale, the Hebridean island, hosted the event. Categories were key kids, teens, adults, and old tossers. So, that's where Johnny Marsh spent the weekend, was it? Our uh, dear Norman Lamont, uh, it's from Dame Alan Neagle of Heston Boom and Bust House, uh, North Somerset. Dear Norman Lamont, I have a foolproof way to get the country back on its feet. 
after several economic body blows. Bring back war bonds and green shield stamps. This will encourage people to save and then purchase things they don't really need, like alarm clocks and tennis rackets. That should get the green shoots of recovery sprouting. Oh, it's a winner. Boom and bust. I thought Gordon Brown said years ago that he had seen the end of boom and bust. Hmm. Really? With the premature switch off of the Swiss particle accelerator, thank heaven we could all have gone nowhere in a great big hole. Scientists were quoted in the paper this morning complaining they'd no longer wake up to the joys of a large hadron in the morning. I read this in The Guardian. I can only assume it's a typing error. <laughs> Dobbers of wording. Mm. I had been told to contact you regarding getting Terry Wogan's autograph. What? No, you've come to the wrong place, Lauren. He's a much younger man. And overheard during Boggy's sailing trip this weekend, crew. That bird over yonder, be he a booby, Captain. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have read this letter before I read that too. What shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor? He'll lie in the morning. Oh, oh, the same as usual. Put him in with Wogan and hope nobody notices. No. I was hoping you would go on to sort of give him lots of money. <laughs> Things are breaking on the boat. He needs the money. This yeah. is what this don't, is all about. Don't tell me the bullocks have gone again. Yeah, I'm afraid so. A wizened old gent with a nautical bent skipped round his poop deck one day. The fuzzy-faced Matalo, with sequined codpiece on show, was giving a hornpipe display. <laughs> but as the shanties grew faster, there was impending disaster with his binnacle was spied from the shore. Ah. With much wincing on the docks and a pair of rollocks, gouged new patterns upon his scrimshaw. Now the wizened old gent with the nautical bent has a lugger for sale, cheaply priced, for his buccaneering ways reached the end of their days once his main brace was totally spliced. Crooky. Yeah, he's got most things in there, hasn't yeah, he? I think so. It was a bit energetic, though, for me. I haven't got enough trouble getting on the thing to start with. What's a scrimshaw? Oh, you had to ask, didn't you? Oh. Oh, do you know, I can't tell you what a scrimshaw is. But Sounds I... like a character from Dickens. I will be able to tomorrow. Will you? Why? Yes. Are you taking... You're not taking to the bounty? No, way. I will do research because, you know, I like to take this job very seriously. <laughs> and if there is a question I can help smooth your day by providing a lucid answer, then, you know, I'm happy to spend the rest of my day today immersed in the internet finding out what a scrimshaw is. Oh, what more can I do for you? Say, this is, after all, public service say, broadcasting. Go and have your full English be here. breakfast and leave <laughs> <in front of. laughs> Listen, there's a bit of a plug here, and I'm oh, the really? one who's going to make right. it. Okay. Right. The big week's just around the corner. We start with Money Can't Buy auctions on Monday the 10th of November this year. Good Lord. But only six weeks away from about from the, from the big night. Mm -hmm. And the Janet and John CDs yes. continue to be popular. Oh. You, you can get all three from www.charitygoods.com or can go to my Radio 2 web pages which have been brought up to date, well, well, up to 2006, and link through from there. Volume 3, The Final Countdown, much mm -hmm. talked about as the best yet, is just 10 quid, features two specially recorded tracks not broadcast on the show. See? <laughs> Charity Goods, P.O. Box 695, Newport, South Wales, NP24ZU. And don't think I won't be reminding people of that. Ooh. Smut. Not That's enough of it, I say. Yes, indeed. Mm. A bit more smut. That'll get the country back on its feet. Ah, Don Bishai says, uh, he's in Inverness, you know. On returning home from Perth at the weekend, I drew into a lay-by on the outskirts of Pitlochry. Don't mention that. Please. And was surprised to see someone had started building a cairn there. They're building a cairn in Pitlochry. Observing an old Scottish custom, I added a stone and hoped the cairn would grow. A fellow motorist informed me it's intended to incorporate a plaque. Where the, and the cairn is finished, and I found it easy to visualise future generations of motorists drawing in to read the inscription and ask, Who is John Marsh? <laughs> you know, I think my points come off my licence this, this, this month, probably. Mm. Well, There's no Marsh, chance you go up to Pitlockery and get some more. No chance. Hmm? Not even for a full Scottish. Well, I don't know, maybe. If it was if free. Had... Of course. Yeah. yeah. The full Scottish, and of course, has... Does uh, that include Haggis, the full Scottish? It has the Baps. <laughs> and full to brim baps. Full to brim baps, it has. And a rowie or two. A rowie? Uh -huh. mm. Jolly good. Now, as I said, as a special treat this morning for the, for the more simple minded, we have Janet and John going to a flower show. Hmm. There's so much here about you, pair, that I think I'm going to be sick. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now that the former singer with Led Zeppelin, Robert Plant, has slammed the door on any further reunion concerts, says Lewis Morris, I suggest the remaining members get a replacement vocalist for a lucrative tour. Mm. I think what they need is someone who is as old as the hills, has led a life of drink and sex fueled excess, and plenty of time in his hands. That's you, Lynn. <laughs> no, Boggy. <laughs> Rehearsals can start immediately, Boggy, whenever you're ready. I don't need to rehearse. If you go out to Pit Lockery today, you're oh. sure of a big surprise. If you go out to Pit Lockery today, you'd better go in disguise. <laughs> for every cop that ever there was will gather there for certain, because today's the day the speeding cops have their picnic. Go speeding time for Boggy Marsh. The little speeding cops are having a lovely time today. Watch them catch you unawares and see them find your money away. Oh, see them gaily dance about. They love to play and shout and boggy will moan all day. Because he tired of his speeding fine. It sort of fell apart towards the end there. I felt I lost the cadence, didn't no, you? No, it was all there. It was all the lack of an orchestra, I think. These budget cuts at the BBC. I know. And I also, say. have a care this morning. Really? Your levels are being monitored. Oh, yes, of course. In case it's you give offence to somebody in Paris. Oh. Or, or, or possibly Brussels. Mm -hmm. Have you had your headphones tested? Are they oh, too loud? What? There's a man out there. That's not a man, that's Trevor. Oh, of course. You were jealous, aren't you, the pair of you? Oh, that? That's been, a lovely box you have I've there. been invited the somewhere rather lovely. special. Unfortunately, there don't appear to be any air tickets uh, in there, really? or indeed an RSVP card, which is promised. Oh, but uh, well. apparently, if I'm prepared to go to Dubai... <laughs> I can have a high old time at the palace. You could sell those little trinkets outside the hotel. Those are not little trinkets. <laughs> Get a those are precious stones. Oh, in those, in those. Are you sure. Mm. And it's, uh, you, it's the palace, and there's the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and there's uh, yes, the Taj Mahal. Nicely shaped piece of plastic they're all resting on. But now, <laughs> oh, you still got that thing. <laughs> Janet and John <laughs> go to a flower show. Today, Janet and John are going to an autumn flower show in the village. Do you like autumn flowers? John puts on his pink flower print dungarees and sparkly gold Wellington boots. The flower show is being held in a big tent in the vicarage lawn. When Janet and John arrive, Janet sees past her kidneys. And Janet... Works <laughs> 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 Sorry. Janet says... I'm just going to talk to Pastor Kidneys about the Harvest Festival. Can I trust you not to get into mischief, John? See John nod his head and do a special newsreader's honour sign with two fingers. <laughs> it's a bit like a scout sign, I suppose. I practice that every day. Mm. John walks around the show looking at all the lovely autumn flowers. John sees Mrs. Defu putting out a display with some very nice pink flowers. Hello, John, says Mrs. Defu. Mrs. Defu is from Guernsey. See the worried bankers. John says, <laughs> see, the very, bankers. see the very pretty flowers? And Mrs. Defue said, they're called Colchian. They're quite like Colchiae, but flower in the autumn instead of the spring. I have pictures here of some of the other varieties I have grown. But people in Guernsey don't oh, talk like that. She sounds, she sounds like she's from Munich. And John says, <laughs> How did this characterization creep in? And John says, They're very pretty. Thank you. And John sees Mrs. Andrew struggling with a big wooden barrel. And John says, Can I help you with that, Mrs. Andrew? Uh, yes, please, says Mrs. Andrew. Thank God she's English. I'm trying to see if it has a hole at the bottom for a tap. But I can't oh, tip no. it over. <laughs> see, see, see John tip up the barrel. See how strong John is. Do you know what a truss is? <laughs> Mrs. Andrew says, oh dear, there are no, there is no hole for the tap. I have the right drill bit in the back of my car, but I'm not very good at DIY. Can you help, John? I think I know where this is going. Certainly, said John, and goes with Mrs. Andrew to fetch the drill bit with a saw attachment. And Mrs. Andrew says, sorry, it's a bit of a mess in the boot, and the tool bag is right at the back. You have longer arms than me, so I'll hold the boot lid for you. Soon John has found a special drill bit and makes a lovely neat hole in the barrel. Clever John. See John hop and skip back to meet Janet. Janet has just finished talking to Pastor Kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Janet, says John. Janet says, Pastor Kidneys has given me a big bunch of his prize carrots. Have you been a good boy? 
Yes, said John. First I saw Mrs. Defeer. She was showing me some lovely pictures of her naked ladies, and then I saw Mrs. Andrew. She said she needed some help, as she had a big butt that needed drilling. <laughs> so I went with her to her car for a special bit. It was a bit of a stretch, but I had to reach around, and soon came back with her whole saw. See Janet go purple and get out the carrots from her back. Did you know that carrots are good for your eyes? Carrots are not good for John's eyes. See John's eyes water. Poor John. I was afraid of that from the beginning. Listen, there's no time really to play any music, John. Can you get to the newsroom? Because it's nearly half eight. I've got to move. I've done that, have I? Oh, God. No, I'll tell you what. I'll play a bit of music. Yeah, I can do it. I, can you? Yeah, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. You, All right. You John, talking, speeding but... to the newsroom. Now, you and I, uh, Lynn, we'll, we'll add lib here. <laughs> no, don't stand not on the order of your going. Go at once. Uh, those people, oh, I know, and don't you read the news any lou louder than a whisper. What a breath of fresh air it is to have Buggy back. <sighs> Ralph, he you says, think? he brings the show down to a low level of filth, smut and innuendo, and a cheeky little leer he sometimes gives the long-suffering taffy traffic as a joy to behold. I have no idea that they could see so much on the radio. Well, they, they put high definition on this uh, camera from the webcam. Have they? Oh, it must be. Yeah. Luckily, we only see the back of your head. Unfortunately, they can see me full front. You're listening to the Wake Up to Wogan podcast from BBC Radio 2. I'm an African prince. Ah. <laughs> prince down the swanee, saying, Dear account holder, I'm an African prince and in a position to help you if you have a bank account in your homeland. Please send me all your passwords and login details, and in return, I will send you five pounds. Sounds like a good deal to me. <laughs> Let's get on that immediately in these straightened times. In the Room 101 feature in the Daily Express, there was a letter of complaints, Pauline Lynch, about professional radio disc jockeys who even in this digital age are unable to fit in a full song before a news bulletin or the end of their show. Who could they mean? I don't know who they could mean, but the word professional <laughs> grates on my tongue. We're Corinthians here, Corinthian casuals. Well, I've surpassed myself in taking togdom to a new level, says Alison Ordnung. Happy gate, Alison. I filled my car with petrol yesterday, and well, aren't you? <laughs> you must be very well off, Alison. I went into a shop to pay. Which pump? asked the attendant, glancing at the forecourt. Number three. Just as I finished paying, a man came into the shop and stood at the next pay point. Which pump? Uh, number three, he said. It can't be. That's already been paid. At this point, I took a longer look at the forecourt and saw there were actually two cars there of the same make, model, and colour as my own. Oops. The fellow was fairly understanding, worked out that if he paid my bill and gave me £5.40, we'd break even, and went out to the car to ask his wife for some change. And I could see that when he explained the situation, she eyed me through the window of her car, scathingly across the forecourt, and I could clearly lip-read, Stupid cat. They say from space you can make out the M25 and the Great Wall of China. Well, you could add to that the hot glow of my cheeks. Oh, this is from Andrew Motion, the Poet Laureate. He writes with a regularity that's sometimes disturbing. When it's John Marsh's turn to read the news, he does a pretty good job. So why is it that your listeners think he's a bit of a, an amateur? I don't know that. I can't tell you. But I do know this. He's a sensitive person. He'll be in. He's got a new shirt this morning as well. Well, I think it's on loan. I think he went down to the outfitters and said, Look, could I, could I try this shirt just for a day? And I let you know. While listening to your show this morning, I happened to look at the radio text scrolling while you were talking, says Sue Godsell. Yes, it's written by some, it's written by a BBC trustee. And we know what they're like. It described your show as the UK's only purveyor of hybrid merry tripe. The full Irish breakfast ease into the day with Wogan's unique breakfast platter. Wogan induces slumbers soft since time immemorial. If a foreigner was reading this, he'd think it was suggesting he woke up and ate an Irishman for breakfast, which would do its level best to send him to sleep, and if he listened on, he'd benefit from a load of old tripe. Well, that, that's the general motif behind it, who God sell. I'm not trying to encourage people to listen to this. <laughs> and, yeah, I did happen to mention uh, Jamie Oliver last night. And um, Did you see that? Does it really have to be F in this and F in this? No, of course it doesn't. It's moronic. And I think, unfortunately, the, the young man has got away so long with the old, um, I'm an ordinary Essex lad gig. 
that he thinks he can get away with anything. Maybe, of course, he's aiming to have his face on as many posters as Gordon Ramsay. But honestly, you know, it's so inarticulate. He never used to be like that, says Lucy Lastic. Seems that, uh, again, Mr Ramsay got away with it. He thinks it's cool. Cool, man. <laughs> honestly, how did we allow ourselves to be put in the hands of cooks? Ah, what ho, me old soft shoe shuffler. Ah, chuffer, chuffer, Dandrews, that's better. This man can speak some English anyway. I've just heard that Ant and Deck were voted off Strictly Come Dancing last Sunday. Did they dance with Gillian Tailford standing on each other's shoulders? They're not exactly basketball players, are they? I'm sure they started out as two of Ken Dodd's diddy men. Dickie Mitt and Harry Cott. What? No, it was Anton Dubec. Anton, it wasn't Ant and Deck that were voted off, although could have been. <laughs> you mean there are three of them? People won't be able to tell them apart? Oh, no, there's two of them. I remember when there were six. Aunt, Deck, Aunt and Dubeck, Cuthbert, Dibble and Grub. I don't know whether to be pleased or disappointed at the discovery that I've something in common with Boggy Marsh. Now, don't get me wrong, says Francis Klonofsky of Leeds. I'm no fop or dandy, nor do I own a boat. I've only one garden shed and don't derive hours of pleasure. No, from playing with the organ. No, it's just that, like Boggy, I'm fast approaching the day when the three points will finally be removed from my license. Like Boggy, I was the victim of a gross miscarriage of justice, not in Pit Lochry as well. Well, an over-enthusiastic speed camera. Ah. Just one question. How is it you can be released early from prison for good behaviour if you've murdered somebody, yet no amount of good law-abiding driving gets you an early release from penalty points? I don't know, Francis. You'll have to ask somebody who knows more about these things than me. I've no penalty points myself. And Donny Gall says, So, yes, the good news that's really been put aside all this stuff about credit crunching and banks collapsing and nobody with any money and no more credit for anything and snow detected on Mars. That brought a smile and a, an enthusiastic whoop from everybody. Ha. You don't suppose uh, the same experts who found this uh, are the ones who've been advising Al Gore on climate change and the Hadron Collider. I can't believe the sun is shining through the dust-encrusted windows of the old BBC attic here. In the midst of all current and uncertainty, it's nice to see closure on one issue that's been troubling us for some time now. What, you mean the snow and Mars? No, says Walter, but the announcement they can now know what caused the fire on the Cutty Sark. Came as a bit of a surprise to me. At school, we were taught in our physics lessons that a vacuum cannot support a fire. Mustache, I've got to get my skiing gear together. I've decided to go to Mars for my winter holiday this year. <laughs> well, if you could get off the planet, it'd probably be a good idea until the old fuss dies down about the banks. As an enthusiastic but wet behind the ears tog, I need your guidance. Paul, lean on me. While driving past RAF Scampton this morning, I noticed a well-armed young man patrolling round the guardhouse, yes, complete in camouflage uniform and beret. The military effect was only spoiled by his high-visibility jacket. Is this the relentless progress of health and safety? <laughs> Should I be applauding the Britishness of this sporting gesture, giving Johnny Foreigner a fighting chance of a shot if things turn nasty? I saw that nice Michael Parkinson. Yes, well, he's everywhere. <laughs> he's all over the place like a cheap suit. I thought he'd retired. No. Henry, I see that nice Michael Parkinson advertising a health plan on telly and decided to sign up. And true to his word, he sent me a welcome gift, a nice DVD player. But I have a problem. Can your listener tell me what to do with it, says old Harry Hawkins. I got the little door thing to open, but the slot was too small for slices of bread. And none of my video cassettes fit anywhere, and it seemed to have absolutely no practical use in the garden. I'm beginning to wish I'd gone with June Whitfield a few years back. He knew where you were with a pen, a carriage clock, or a radio. Are we to infer the current Radio 2 campaign, 70 not out? James Burton Stewart of Reading says, Isn't somebody connected with your own recent milestone? 70 these days? Not out. Just run in. Not only has Jezza Vine, a man well-versed in the art of delegation, uh, been plugging this Radio 2 initiative, Ken Bruce, a special 70 Not Out Popmaster special. Are we to expect a 70 Not Out Janet and John? No, because it's too close to the truth. You're listening to the Wake Up to Wogan podcast from BBC Radio 2. Ah, uh, from Her Majesty's Submarine... <laughs> 
won't believe this. However, it's in praise of Dolly Parton, who we played yesterday. A fine lump of a girl. And the lads from the mess deck would like to request more exposure of Dolly Parton in your programme. We think she's amazing. Amazing. Gorgeous. And we have our own appreciation society here on the boat, which meets every Tuesday at Six Bells in the aft torpedo room. We have our own costumes and prosthetics, and it's great fun. <laughs> in the crushed confines of a submarine. The Warrant Artificer Technical Aft Torpedoes Weapons and Training, that's what it what, thinks it's all a bit PC, but he's old school, and all tastes are catered for. In the Andrew today, more power to your illustrious organ. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's an ordinary seaman whose name I don't think we can bother with. Yeah, so, as I said, time to say goodbye to Boggy Marsh, but not yet. He'll be with us through the long and weary morning. And, and uh, I heard uh, Alice Richardson saying uh, about uh, Dave Cameron's speech, which seems to have caught you by the throstle. Well, I have a plan. I have a flan. I have a pam. I have a... Referring to pam, referring to the responses in yesterday's programme about Dave's speech and his comment that he was a man with a plan, do you think the speech was written for him by Baldrick? Ah, a cunning plan. Did I hear correctly that Dave is a man with a pram? Did he declare it in the list of members' interests? I think we should be told, says Rambo. Jan says, credit crunch? What credit crunch? There are just two places in the world where you can escape from the gloom and doom of the credit crunch, belt tightening and lessons in prudence. Yes, Walford and Weatherfield. Little bubbles of unreality. Yes, I do think perhaps they ought to be reflective of the current uh, crisis. Uh, lunch break pints at the Rovers are still popular. There's been no mention of redundancies in the Knicker factory. And similarly, the Queen Vic still does a roaring trade. The drinks are usually on the house. Well, Peggy is going to have a party for the family. And the laundrette is still earning Mr Papadopoulos a bob or two. And Tanya has had an offer on her house. Pigs will be flying round the square very soon. And worried about investing, follow this advice. If you'd purchased a thousand pounds off Northern Rock shares one year ago, it would be worth four pounds ninety five. With H Boss, earlier this week your one thousand pounds would have been worth sixteen pounds fifty. One thousand uh, invested in XL Leisure would be worth less than a fiver. But if you bought a thousand pounds worth of lager one year ago, drank it all, and took the empty cans to an aluminium recycling plant, you'd get two hundred and fourteen pounds. So based on the above statistics, the best current advice drink heavily and recycle. So, what did you get for National Potato Day? says Ralphie. N zip nothing. Not a spud in sight, not a chip, not a saute. Nothing. There's some good old bangers and mash probably on its way up to you. No, there isn't. There's nothing. Short commons. Apparently, the potato sellers of Britain do not want our help. <laughs> and so, they won't get it. And, ah, a man wrote to me yesterday from uh, darkest Africa. <laughs> Can you say that anymore? Probably not. A field in Africa he was in, and he said he'd just got broadband. And Dilop Doris says, A field in Africa? I've been waiting for broadband since May. And BT still can't give us a date. Maybe Wolverhampton's a bit too remote. <laughs> yes, this wonderful world. Oh, look, Chuffer Dandridge is writing. Oh, how is Chuffer? What homey old film fans of the formerly famous. Ah, uh, did I hear your Cardiff cracker? I'd pull her. Mentioned my old mucker, Marston Mortain, mm, yesterday. Very busy, yeah. Great actor. Could play the lot. Drunken Germans to tipsy Teutons. Speciality was going from a stiff-legged goose-step to an inebriated lurch, quicker than you could count Heinz zwei, drei in countless old war films like Lederhosen in the Luftwaffe, the drunken Dumpkopf that lost the war, and Big Hands and Little... <laughs> <laughs> He finished his career playing comedy mine host types, serving drink behind the bar in Ealing comedies. Watch him carefully in any film, you'll notice he looks more and more drunk each time the camera pans back to him, until he's invariably replaced by another actor altogether as the scene ends. You can sometimes spot him later in the film, hugging people in crowd scenes, singing loudly at inappropriate moments and seeming to wave playfully at the camera. That's real acting. He wasn't German at all, though, reared in the Isle of Dogs. And they say the camera never lies. Dame Footlights is a sozzle trollop. <laughs> so are most of my leading ladies. The controller's assistant is... Ah, mm. the economic situation, I'm afraid. Oh. Dame Leslie is insisting on savings. 
Oh, no. There'll be an, a bacon body delivered at 8. Oh, there was, yeah. With a knife and four plates. Ketchup will be cha- charged for. You and your team must talk more. This will save money on music royalties. The Newsreader of the Week will now run through all the local news and upcoming events, and Lynn Bowles is expected to report on all roadworks currently in place. Any time left after you've read the emails may be used by playing a maximum of two songs. Well, it's rarely more than that played here anyway. The show will only be broadcast every other day to save on electricity. Ms Douglas, oh, Dame Leslie Douglas, is confident that with age overtaking your listeners so rapidly, there's no chance that anyone will notice. She takes a sardonic view, doesn't she? Does she? Somewhere, mm. yeah. However, you'll be getting a pay rise. The new Ooh. minimum wage rate has just taken effect. I saw that. Finally, yeah. And as of next week, you and your assistants will all climb the dizzy heights of £5.73 an hour. That sort of makes up for everything, doesn't it? I know, there's going to be a nasty fight for that bacon butter. Yeah, I'm going to buy the Lamborghini now. You're listening to the Wake Up to Wogan podcast from BBC Radio 2. Oh, to be in Uckfield now that autumn's there. Oh, yes. For whoever goes to Uckfield may well be unaware that someone lives in Uckfield who'll fill them with great fear. A scruffy sort of ragatag who still owes me a beer. That's wilting, of course. We've yeah. never forgotten. That. Never, never forgotten. Yes. Sadly, and I do try. Forgotten, but not gone. Yes. The lonesome traveller voyaged north on the old A9 to Bitlochry. He flogged the horses for all they were worth and said, It flashed! Hoek! <laughs> they've got me! <laughs> and tired of this camera joke that robbed his daily bread, he sold the car and bought a boat and went to sea instead. I'll go east and see the dolphins, he said. I'll go west and see the turtles. But all our fish-faced lad could do was sail around in circles. <laughs> and my cholesterol, that was. I've mended that now. It's all right. Oh, I do good. occasionally go in a straight line. Was that your bailiwick? It's stopping is the problem. Hmm? My bailiwick... How do you stop a boat? How do you stop... Have you got an anchor? No, but I've got a wife that I tie to her up, chuck her over the side. It stops pretty quickly. <laughs> That's lovely, isn't it? So rude. Thank heaven she doesn't <laughs> listen to this rubbish. Now, look, just as an added, an added treat and, and a warning for people to get out of town quickly, um, there's a Janet and John oh, no. story this morning. I deny everything now. Yeah. And I do not skip. Um, <laughs> now, John and Janet go to an antiques fair. Janet says, Don't take too long getting ready, John. I'm nearly ready, says John. He's getting worse. I just have to put on my beauty spot. <laughs> John is dressed in a lilac frock coat, silver and black striped waistcoat, a frilly shirt and a powdered wig. John is a dandy and a popinjay. The antiques fair is in a very big hall. Janet says, why don't you go and play with the other children while I look around? Try not to get into trouble. I won't, says John. See John run round and round the hall, do big slides on his knees <laughs> on the polished floor. <laughs> when John is quite tired, he stops near a stall selling stamps. John likes stamps. The ladies running the stall introduce themselves as Mrs. Damone and Mrs. Lockett. And John says, I have some nice stamps at home stuck into... Sorry. I have some nice stamps at home. <laughs> I just lost the character there for a moment. Mm, sorry, love. I have some nice stamps at home stuck into an album. And Mrs. Damone says... Have you been collecting for a long time? And John says, yes, ever since I was very young. And he said, I have a very nice Victorian stamp in an old album. I like the pretty purple ones best. And Mrs. Lockett says, if you've any of the purple tannin books, <laughs> I'd be very interested in seeing them. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be so careful with them, as <laughs> the gum can cause discoloration if they're not mounted properly. <laughs> Mrs. Damone says, I have one here. It's not in very good condition. We say touched in the trade, but if you're interested, we could let you have one at trade price. And Mrs. Lockett says, we also have some very nice correspondence from some of Louis XIV's court officials, if you like that sort of thing. Do you like spending money? John doesn't. John said, thank you, I'll think about it, and hops and skips off to find Janet. And John sees Janet looking at an old washing mangle. Hello, Janet. Have you been a good boy? Yes. 
I saw Mrs. Simone and Mrs. Lockett. Both ladies were very interested in my purple Tannenberg. I thought that was <laughs> even a slightly touched one. They said they didn't even mind a bit of gumming. Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Simone said something a bit more subtle than a rough mounting would be needed to bring out the best. Mrs. Lockett said she also had a nice selection of French letters if I was interested in that sort of thing. Do you know how to test an old washing mangle? <laughs> Janet does. See Janet feed John's beard into the mangle. <laughs> in the screen. I'm not getting any better now. This was a podcast from BBC Radio 2. Don't forget you can also download free podcasts for Steve Wright, Russell Brand and Chris Evans. Get more information now at bbc.co.uk slash radio2. And wake up to Wogan every weekday morning from 7.30. Online, on digital, and on 88 to 91 FM. Wake up to Wogan!